Mike, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine, Chris. Excellent, fantastic. As always, I'm looking at my audio meters first off to make sure that we are actually streaming. Yeah, we seem to be streaming all right. Uh, we've had echo problems in the past, so if anyone who's watching can let us know if there's anything wrong with the audio, that'd be fantastic. Um, yeah, so so let's get started. Uh, so I'll do my usual thing and just introduce what this is all about. So this is Calico Live. It, um, Calico Live's an occasional um, stream that lets you get in touch with uh, Tigera and find out more about what we're doing um, with Project Calico. The idea is it's supposed to be kind of an informal live way for us to catch up. So. We do have a script, but we don't stick to it very closely, and and the and the script is quite loose. And the idea is just that we that we um, can chat in a in a relaxed way. Um, on that topic, we can get sidetracked, and it's great if we do get sidetracked. I'm very happy to. So, if anyone has questions, we are so happy to hear them. Um, usually, we don't get enough. I don't know if it's people not wanting to to speak up um, or feeling nervous or whatever, but don't feel embarrassed. Any question too hard or too easy is totally fine. And if it's if it's too hard, we'll just take it offline, and if, and, um, and if it's easy, then, then no problem. Um, so we're up to episode 10 already, which is fantastic. Now, those of you who are paying attention a few weeks ago will know that we were originally going to have um, Peter uh, join us today, but uh, he's had to be uh, waylaid. Um, so Mike Stephen has kindly joined us. Um, so I'll just introduce myself, and then, um, Mike, I'll let you um, introduce yourself, unless you want me to. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll go first. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I confused you. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I'm Chris Tompkins. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera. Um, my role is kind of to champion our users' needs and to support our uh, community and make sure that their voices are heard. Um, I've been working in networking for 20 years, more than 20 years, which is scary. And I, I kind of got got bored of um, managing single devices and, and got interested in SDN and automation. And that led me to Kubernetes and to um, Calico. So, Mike, how about you? Yeah. Uh, so, as uh, as you've said, Chris, my name's Mike Stephen. I'm a senior software engineer in Tigera, um, working on the app security team in Cork in Sunny Island. Hang on, there's at least and, a, well, at least one lie there. I've spotted already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, largely working on WireGuard, which we'll be talking about today, which is an encryption technology, and also on some other um, other features as well. Um, so, I've joined. Joined back in February of this year, um, so I, I guess that's ten months. Um, yeah, fantastic. February. I, that's. I could also say that ten months is the amount of networking experience that I've had compared to your twenty years, which is so. incredible. We'll get. Yeah, we'll dive into that in a second. <laughs> We're going to talk quickly about um, quickly about that. I, I, I find that hard to believe because you're pretty darn well informed already. Then, well, I um, had some good teachers. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, so. I'm just having a quick look at the chat to make sure we haven't had anyone saying the audio is bad. No one's saying the audio is bad, so that's great. Um, I do have a message here, though. I'll just have a quick look at it now to make sure it's not. I oh, know it's, it's nothing to do with this. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned that you're working on um, WireGuard and other features as well. Um, you know, as we br briefly mentioned before, you know, we, we're staying on open source on this podcast, but just out of interest, that's I think Egress Gateway, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's an enterprise feature yeah. that we have. Um, yeah, cool. So just started any... working on that. Cool. So. so we won't mention any more about that now. But if anyone's interested, then then go look it up. Cool. Okay, cool. That's cool. So uh, let's dive into with you first of all. I think we've got, we've got quite a lot to cover in the demo today. Um, so let's we, we'll, we won't spend too long on this. Um, but yeah, I just mm -hmm. I wanted to know a bit more about you. Um, how did you get into coding? Then I know you, as you said, you haven't been doing network coding for very long. But yeah, so. I guess my first experience was my dad was an electrical engineer when I was growing up. Um, he brought home a VIC-20 at one point. So started doing basic on the VIC-20, um, coding in programs from the backs of magazines, as, as you, you might have done yourself, Chris. I did. Yeah. So um, had a VIC-20 and then a Mac, which is maybe why I'm a Mac fanboy now. <laughs> and um, yeah, so then just decided that would be an interesting career, loves playing games growing up as well. So that's another thing that gets people into this industry. I yes, think. so much so, yeah. On the Mac thing, yeah. it's 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 funny that if you just held on to that Mac that you had all those years ago oh. and looked after it and kept the box, we probably wouldn't be talking now. <laughs> <laughs> um, worth a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. What, so what would that, that would be in the early 90s? Yeah, uh, even late 80s, I'd say. Because I had, I say I, my, my dad and mum had two Apple IIe's 
um, oh, yeah. which yeah, those if you had the boxes Grand for those, machines. yeah, cool machines. And if you had the boxes, you'd be doing all right, wouldn't you? Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, and how about so? How about networking then? You you because you were where were you before um, Tamera? So, so I guess for, for, I, I've had about twenty years' experience as well in the industry, and but that's all been doing java-based largely java-based um business applications so for the insurance industry sports statistics um other kind of SaaS products as well so i first came across kubernetes probably five years ago at this stage i guess one of the companies so i, I joined recently to previously to tigera uh, was using kubernetes for some of their microservices they right. still had a monolith as well yeah uh, but some of the newer stuff was on microservices. So that's when I kind of first started to use it and appreciate what it can do for developers. Yeah, I was. So it was good. Yeah, it's quite interesting to hear it quite, from quite different angles because um, I was, yeah, my first exposure to Kubernetes was being asked to network it. You know, the, and I previous I'd, you know, done the same thing for kind of OpenStack and, and other things. And obviously, the first thing about networking Kubernetes is to understand what you're actually networking, and, and that's coming that way. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. So, like I said, we've got quite a lot to get get on with. Um, so, I'll just ask you one more question. What's your favorite uh, bit of your work at the moment? What, what's kind of making you interested? Um, I think the new feature I'm working on at the moment, um, the egress gateway feature, um, I, I find that quite interesting because it, technically it's challenging, but at the same time, um, getting to talk with customers and actually get the requirements. Yeah, that's fun. No, from the horse's fun. mouth, and um, that's that's a nice change. That doesn't happen everywhere. So yeah, it is good. Um, yeah, cool. All right, we'll talk more about that offline. Um, so mm. I reckon I was going to ask you a bit about Cork and how things are going over in Cork, but I I think sure. actually that let's let's put that to the end of the call because I'm conscious that we may run out of time, especially if people ask questions. So we'll okay. we'll pop the stuff gotcha. to Cork at the end because Peter can handle that on a later call as well. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think we should dump straight into this demo because I think people are quite interested in it. So, so the the short story of this, and I'll I'll do a sh screen share any moment now. But the the short story of what we're actually doing, uh, what we're going to demo is, uh, I had this requirement for a blog post to build a live um, uh, uh, to build a, a, a two cluster um, Kubernetes setups, uh, two clusters, four nodes in each. And I wanted to inter directly interconnect them with BGP to prove whether that was possible to myself. Um, and then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to see if I could do this all entirely in my laptop? And and then I started doing so, and, and lo and behold, it worked. And I had to jump through a few hoops. And then I thought, well, Mike's obviously got a lot of um, WireGuard knowledge, so let's uh, let him cover off that side. So. Um, I'll, I'll show you a diagram of what we're going to build now, and we're going to build this whole thing live. Um, <laughs> You're brave, Chris. I know. Tell me about it. Uh, oh, that's the wrong. Something's gone wrong with my share. Hold on. That's a good start, isn't it? Um... Oh yes, yeah, sorry. It's because I've clicked the wrong. Yeah, sorry. All right. Um, you were briefly very large on the screen there, Mike. So. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, right. So this image here is, is uh, showing what we're going to build. But actually, um, uh, right. So this is all in my laptop, this this uh, larger black outline. Um, can you see my mouse pointer? Yeah, yeah, that's all Brilliant. good. Fantastic, cool. Okay, so this this larger black outline is is the edge of my laptop essentially. Um, at the top here, we've got my uh, local routing for my actual uh, uh, routing. So my this is my external IP of my laptop ten eleven ten one five eight, and then we have this one seven two seventeen Docker Bridge network, and in that Docker Bridge network, um, we are going to build two clusters, um, uh, two Kubernetes clusters, each with four nodes. Um, so you can see the the node IPs are all in green on on node cluster A over here, and yep. in blue we've got the four IPs of the cluster B, and then we're going to peer them directly with eBGP. Now this isn't something you often need to do in production, but one of the many reasons that I did this was because I wanted to see if this would work and to learn the subtleties of what would happen when I did. Um, so there are other things to talk about here. Um, but I think we'll start it building and we can actually discuss whilst the build is happening. Um, but sure. so, I, so the only other thing I'll point out at this stage is that um, the pod cider and service ciders don't, uh, they've got 10200 and 10201 on the left hand side and 10210, 10211 on the right hand side. 
Um, and they've got different AS numbers. They have, yeah, yeah, they have, yeah. And I'll, yeah. I'll get I'll get into more detail on that when we get to the BGP build because there's a, there's reasons for that. Um, so this is what I originally tried to build, and you can see that you have two separate subnets, but it becomes a lot more complicated because you've got multi-hop eBGP up here. So that's where I'm going to start with this kind of story, and and the story is that I spoke to the Minikube team, who uh, taught me or who actually, uh, who, who actually um, took an issue and, and raised a PR almost immediately, which I, I'm so thankful for, um, to be able to build two clusters in the same um, subnet. So let's, without further ado, let's do that. Um, can you read my terminal window? Is yeah. That, yeah, fantastic. That's great. So if I quickly just um, uh, show the fact that I've got no Minikube clusters at all running at the moment, so um, Minikube's totally mm -hmm. empty. Minikube's a way of running, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a way of running a, a local cluster. So the uh, first thing I'm going to do is build a cluster called cluster A. So while that's running, we can look at what the command actually did. It's up here. And the only thing I've specified at the moment is that I want a cluster. I want it to be called cluster A. Um, I'm telling it that I don't want a network plugin yet. I don't want Calico or any other network plugin yet. Um, and I'm doing that because we want to add it ourselves in a moment. Um, the then I'm, I'm telling it what I want the pod network cider to be and the service uh, cider. And I'm telling yep. it that I want it to use this layer two uh, Docker bridge network. Um, now that, uh, and then I forget what this does. Um, I think it tells it to not try to statically assign the, the IPs or something like that. So uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, <laughs> me neither. So that, that's, that's fine. Um, I, it's one of the new switches. So anyone who, who attempts to follow along will find that these commands don't work unless you're running the version that I'm running, which was kindly survived by um, by the Minikube team. So anyone who wants to try and follow along uh, can talk to me on the Calico user Slack and, and I can point them in the right direction. So that's brilliant. That's just finished. It's just finished downloading the image. Uh, 122, interestingly, not 123. Um, cool. Right, so that's cluster A built, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put the Tigera operator onto cluster A. Now while we wait for that to do its thing, I'll just explain a little bit more about the BGP. Um, as you rightly picked up, uh, on the left, cluster A has got um, AS64512, and uh, cluster B has got AS64513. Now, I'm not going to teach everything about BGP, but the interesting thing about that is that because the number is different, it, it means that the BGP protocol knows that that means that it's um, eBGP, um, and therefore that affects how the routing is actually advertised. And the other, mm -hmm. thing, the other thing that's interesting to notice here is that within the cluster, you have iBGP. And that's basically, again, BGP knows if you ha if the other cluster, if the other node has the same AS number as me, then that's iBGP. All right, so let's jump across to the window, to the terminal, and then we'll come, we'll talk a little bit more about the BGP while it's building. Um, I should just say, I can see we've got a couple of people watching. So if anyone has questions, um, then feel free to shout. Uh, and if not, you can always ask me offline later. Cool, so the next thing is we're gonna put the Tigera operator onto cluster A. And the Tiger operator's job is essentially to take a candidate target um, Calico configuration and deploy it on the cluster. So the operator's already on there, it's that, it's that quick. And the next thing we do is we give it a, um, a manifest. And the manifest looks like this. Um, uh, it basically just specifies how the the target cluster should look. And the only thing that we care about here is that the uh, pod cider has to match what I specified before. And it's <laughs> it's worth noting as well that the encapsulation's turned off. So we've got no VXLAN, no IP IP or anything like that. Yeah. So next thing I do is, is bung that. So what, what I've just done is I've deployed a custom resources manifest. And that manifest is, a, is this target configuration and now the uh, Tiger operator will will go away and make it make it so basically. So if we have a look, we should see. 
yeah, we can see that, that there's the tiger, op tiger operator and we can see it's building. So by the way, Mike, if I, if I say anything that you think I could have explained that better, just just dive in. Um, <laughs> Nothing yet, that's for sure. Yeah, well, when we get when we get on, doing great. Thanks, man. When we get to the second half, um, it'll be we'll yeah. be talking a lot more about WireGuard, so I'll lean on you more then. Sure. Um, sure. And it's fine to ask questions as well. I, I really enjoy these sessions because I can always. Why? Say, I, yeah. do, I do have a question. Like, yeah, why, why might why might a customer want to have a network topology like this, or what would? Well, it's funny you should ask that. Um, this the my requirement for originally wanting to test to test this was because a customer had a, a scenario where they were really dead set on doing this and and i i gave this design and said this will work and then i thought afterwards i thought mm, i better check it does actually work <laughs> um so it's unusual because usually um the bgp is is peering with the top of rack switch um to, to peer two clusters directly like this the only reason you'd want to do it is if you want the pods in each cl to cluster to be directly accessible to each other, as if they mm -hmm. are, as if they are in the same cluster, which we'll demo at the end. So, yeah. um, cool. So that's that's worked. Um, Calico nodes running. Uh, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy this Echo Server pod, which is just a test pod that we're going to uh, that we're going to use to test things at the end. And yeah. then I'm going to add three more nodes using Minikube cluster A profile, profile cluster A node add. So this is where my laptop starts to catch on fire because the, so now we've got a cluster of four nodes, each with two virtual CPUs and two, yep. gig, two gig of RAM. So that'll take a moment. I can see the, the flames emoticon there. <laughs> yeah. but. It's quite weird that, that Minikube uses these emojis. Um, you don't often see command line tools that have emojis in their output. No. I kind of like it, but it, it's it's not common, is it? No. So this is a good time to say if anyone's got questions again, dive in. Um, but we're just building we're building this um, topology over here. And if you've joined us late, this whole session is being recorded, so you can watch the whole thing back um, and catch up. So this should be done. Now, one time, Mike, I'm going to be, I'm going to preempt this not working and say one time I saw, I, I've spun this, this up several times. One time mm -hmm. I saw one of the nodes not join properly. Um, so it'll be interesting. I've only seen it happen once. Um, it looks like it's, I think it's going to be all right this time. You can see the last, the last mm -hmm. node is not ready, but that's probably just because it's still building Calico node and so on. Um, so we'll come back to that. And mm -hmm. the other thing that is an interesting, there are two interesting, I don't want to call them bugs, but two interesting things that I'm chatting with the Minikube team about, about this patch that they gave me that allows you to deploy two uh, clusters into the same um, layer two. One of them is that uh, if we do Docker network LS, you'll see that Docker has created, an, Docker and Minikube have created a new bridge just like I asked them to, called Calico Cluster Peer Demo. But actually, if we look at the routing, you'll see that the IPs of the nodes are in 172.17. If we look at the routing table, 172.17 is pointing to Docker Bridge 0, yeah. which, which is that bridge. And this one, ending ABE8, is 192.168.49. So I'm chatting to the mini Minikube guys about this because what it basically seems to mean to me is that even though it's created this layer two bridge, it isn't using it, it's using this one instead. But that's no problem for for the purposes of our demo. Um, the other thing is that when we no added the nodes, it's tried to be helpful and it's added KineNet, which is another CNI. We definitely don't, okay. don't want that, so we're gonna rip that off. So we go ahead and do that. And that's just basically we delete the daemon set in Coop system for KineNet, and that rips KineNet off. So now if we just look at our pods again, oops, flags cannot be placed before. What am I missing there? Okay, it's all right. So I'll just use something from my history instead. I'll cheat by using my history. 
Or you're missing gear. Oh, okay. I, I was missing gear, wasn't I? Yeah, I just call that. Just yeah. yeah, well, good spot. Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. So you can see this is the state of the cluster. There's nothing funky here. It's just the usual Calico stuff. The Echo Server test pod, Core DNS, Etcd, and everything yep. else, and our operator. Now let's see if that last node is healthy now. Yeah, it is. There we go. Cool. So that's that. So we've got the we've got the cluster, but at the moment, um, well, actually, I'll, what I'll do is before we drill into cluster B, I'll just show something which I think is interesting, which is if I use a for loop to SSH to all four of the nodes in cluster A, you can see that, uh, and then I do. Oh no, I've missed something. Sorry, I just realised I missed a step. Before I do that, I need to install Calico Cuttle on all the nodes. So while that's running, you can see the command here. I just use a for loop and SSH to each node. And then I download the latest Calico Cuttle. Nice. And it would be nice, except I just realized that is not the latest Calico Cuttle anymore. So I think we're gonna to need to run that command again. Sorry about that, everyone. Because I think we just, 321.2 just came out, didn't it? I think so. Uh, let me try that. So I'll just run that command again. Oh, damn it. Excuse my friend. I, I sl snuck a hash in there, oh, yeah. my mistake. So I can see we've got quite a few viewers. So if anyone has any questions about what I'm doing or why I'm doing it or anything like that, um, Mike is going to dive in uh, and, and help us more with the WireGuard part more towards the end of the build. Um, but in the meantime, if anyone's got, anyone's got questions, just shout. And I've kind of got one eye on it over here. Uh, nothing's too easy or too hard. We can always take it offline. So um, this is cluster A. You can see we've got four nodes. They're all healthy. They're all addressed as we, as we want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, we can see that. I'm just giving the lay of the land here, really, but you can see that we've got the pods, they're all healthy, and the last thing is we've got uh, we've got a echo server service as well, which has an internal cluster IP, but it has no external IP yet. Cool, right, now okay. um, we installed Calico Cuttle, so what we can do now is we can run a for loop again, and we can run Calico Cuttle node status on all four nodes. The reason I want to do this at this point is to show that even though I haven't configured any BGP, we already have a BGP full mesh. Um, and just to go to dig into the BGP a little bit, anytime that you use iBGP, um, iBGP has a loop prevention rule um, that I call BGP Split Horizon, but I'm not sure if that's its actual proper name. Um, and what it basically means is, in an IBGP scenario, no node is ever allowed to advertise a route um, that it learnt from one IBGP peer to another IBGP peer. So for example, in this diagram, cluster A, if it learns a route from this M03 node, it can't re-advertise that route to M04. Mm -hmm. And the side effect of that rule, um, which that rule is for loop prevention, the side effect of that rule is that in an IBGP domain, all of your routers have to be peered with each other directly. There is, there's a caveat and an asterisk that I'll, that I'll talk about later, but for now that's that's it, right? So, so you can see that the default behavior, because we don't, don't have any encapsulation, no VXLAN and no IP and IP, the default behavior was for the, for the operator to set us up with BGP mm -hmm. and for that to be a full mesh. And we can see that full mesh is running and, and everything's healthy. So that's the yep. current state of play. So, so that's good. They all know about each other. Yeah, exactly. And the, and, yep. the, and I didn't configure anything. And they're actually using AS64512 already. Um, I can see we've got a question. So I'm just going to kick off um, cluster B building. So I'm going to now going to build cluster B. And I'll, while while that's building, I'll, I'll have a look at this question. Uh, right. So cluster B is building. So Nathan's asked. Just to clarify when you when you're done. Uh, so no, Nathan, we're going to be able to reach pod to pod from one cluster to another. Um, and I'll actually demonstrate that. So we'll be able to take a pod that's running in, on a node down here and not, not specifically, I'll put it on one of the root reflector clients as well, which I'll talk about. And you'll see that we'll be able to communicate directly from a pod in this uh, cluster to a pod in this cluster. 
and there'll be no NAT or any encapsulation involved. Um, cool, all right, so cluster B is built. The only difference is that it's pod cider is 10 to 10 and it's service cider is 10 to 11. Then I'm gonna blast through the other commands. So I'm, in, so I'm putting the operator on there again. Um, and I've got another, um, another manifest for the operator. And the only difference in this manifest is again, encapsulation is turned off, but this time the pod side is different. Um, cool, so I just bang that in there and... Sorry, Chris, yeah. I might've missed a step, but yeah, how, how, did they, how did they learn what the AS number is? Um, no, you didn't miss a step. I, I should have explained it more clearly. Um, this one is 64512, and that's because it's the default. Um, for not, not the default for BGP, there is no default for BGP, but it's the default for um, Calico. Um, okay. And that, that, it's really good that you asked that question. It's not a, it's not a setup, but it's actually a really good question <laughs> because, because a lot of people worry about BGP and they worry because they, we've all read scary outages caused by BGP misconfiguration. But we're actually spinning up two clusters here in the same layer two domain both with six, the same AS number initially, because I'm gonna change cluster B's AS number, but I haven't done okay. that yet. And that's totally fine because BGP doesn't have any kind of discovery mechanism. Um, so it's fine for the two clusters to be sat alongside each other using the same AS number, nothing will blow up and all behave fine. Um, so we've had, um, we've had a couple more questions. Um, Ivan's asked if it's possible to use an encapsulation. Yeah, it should be. Um, we're not going to here, but I believe it ought to be. Um, we can actually, we'll probably run out of time to test it today, but Ivan, if you and I chat offline, we can actually test that out. Um, we can actually test that out. And Nathan said, will this work with eBPF and play? Yeah, it'll work. Uh, I, I bet my life on it. Um, so here we go. So, um, right. So we're next gonna stick that echo server on there. And then we're adding the three nodes. So this is where my laptop really catches on fire because I'm live streaming to YouTube and running a Kubernetes nodes and lots of BGP sessions. So this is really asking for trouble at this point. Um, okay, so what we're doing now is we're running through the same build process for cluster B that we ran through for cluster A. Um, we're the, the four nodes are already there. Well, well, actually I say that the last, last, the third one's been created. Um, and then we're just going to disable kindnet like we did before. It's funny going back to, so, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Mike. I was just going to say, so when, when both clusters are brought up with the same AS number, they just think they're all talking IBGP and well, so they are, so what, yeah, what so we'll actually see it in a second, but but both, the, the key thing about BGP to remember is that BB, BGP doesn't have any kind of discovery mechanism. It literally has to build neighbor relationships. So the only way that cluster A knows where the other members, BGP members are, is because they're being communicated via um, the Kubernetes API, via Calico. Otherwise, mm -hmm. there would be no peerings there. They don't have, like, other routing protocols like OSPF, EIGRP, they can discover their neighbors, but that doesn't exist here. So in both both of these clusters, they're both, initially, they're both using AS64512, but they won't speak to each other each other in any way because they both know, they only know their own set of peerings. Yeah. Um, cool, all right, so that cluster's finished building, and I can actually kind of show you what I was just saying a bit, actually. If I just, uh, so I've deleted the kindnet CNI that we don't want, and I'm just going to stick the, um, Calico Cuttle onto the cluster B nodes. Just like we did, exactly the same as we did for cluster A. That's why I'm not kind of diving into the commands too much. Yeah. I can see you using 33212 there. Yeah, exactly. I, did, I didn't make that mistake twice. Um, yeah, and then what I'll show you is that you'll see that the two clusters are totally healthy. The only difference from the diagram at this point is that they're both running 64512 and that these eBGP peerings aren't here. And then there's no root reflectors yet. 
Uh, we'll dive into that in a sec. Cool. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We are going to have time to cover this, but yeah, we are going to have to go pretty quick. Um, I'm going to make a blog post based on this anyway, though. So, so if we have a quick look at our nodes, you can see we've got four ready nodes and their IP addresses match. And if we look at our services, we've got, a, we've got the echo server service again. Uh, and we look at our pods. Everything's healthy, which is a miracle because it's a demo. Everything looks all right. Okay, cool. So now if we look at our BGP, um, you'll see that cluster B has a full node, a full mesh IBGP, just like cluster A did. But um, you can't see the AS number here, but you, you can take my word for it that it's 64512. But, but they just, they're just not talking to each other. So, so both clusters have a full mesh, but they're not talking. Um, right, so at this point, this is where it starts to get interesting. This is where now we need to do the customization for the BGP. Now, you missed something, you missed trying to catch me out, which is, <laughs> if you look at the IBGP in the cluster here, you'll see that I said they had a full mesh, but in the, in the diagram, these oh, yeah. two bottom nodes aren't talking to each other. And that's because we're using something called root reflectors. Um, and I know you know some of this already, Mike, so. Uh, I'm rusty on root reflectors. Well, actually. that's all right. So I'll, I'll tell you again then. Um, but but yeah, uh, for the benefit of anyone who doesn't know, um, what a root reflector is, is basically a way to get around the scalability issues that come from IBGP. So um, as you add more IBGP routers, the problem is that event, that it's exponentially, you get exponentially more peerings as every router mm -hmm. needs to peer with every, every other router. So a root reflector is nothing more than an IBGP peer which it is allowed to break the rules about not forwarding routes learned from an, an IBGP peer to another IBGP peer. So to say that again, mm -hmm. this guy is a root reflector and because he or she knows that um, it knows that, it, uh, it, that, that, it's <laughs> that, it, that it's allowed to advertise um, routes that it's learned from, uh, an, from another member, Mm -hmm. It basically gets rid of the requirement to for a full mesh. So and I guess on a diagram with only four nodes in the cluster, it's not going to be noticeable, but in a larger cluster, it would. Exactly that. And that's why I did it here, because now you could add another, if you had a, a beefy enough laptop, you could add another 10 root reflector client nodes, mm -hmm. and they would not need to peer with each other. The root reflector clients only need to peer with the root reflectors, and the root reflectors need to peer with everyone else, including each other. Gotcha. Um, now, That's cool. Yeah, so we're going to implement that now in Calico, so I'll show you how. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply this um, BGP configuration to cluster A. Now you can see that it's a... Um, custom resource, one of our custom resources, it's a BGP configuration. We're not changing the AS number because this is cluster A. Yep. We're not changing the BGP listen port, just to take a sidestep, BGP talks on TCP 179. Um, so it doesn't, uh, we're not changing that. Um, mm -hmm. But what we are doing is at the moment, we, we're still keeping the full mesh for now. Until um, you set it up. Yeah, exactly. Until we've finished setting it up. And the last thing we're doing is telling it that its service cluster IP range is is what it is. And and yeah. telling it this tells Calico that we do want to advertise our service cluster range. All right, so we'll apply that. Mm -hmm. Done. And we're, we, we've got an identical one for cluster B. And for cluster B, We've got the same deal. The only difference is that the AS number is 64513 and the range here has changed. But what's cool about this is we yeah. can actually see BGP restart. So when we apply this, if we look at the BGP status for cluster A, we'll see that BGP has been up for 20 minute, 20, approximately 20 minutes. But if we look at cluster B, you can see that BGP just restarted yeah. because the AS number changed. Yeah. So that would have been that would have been a momentary blip if you had production workloads here. If you had production 
work loads on this cluster, that would have been a momentary blip. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's cool. So now we're now we've got um, the cluster A and cluster B, and they're both running on their own AS numbers now. So the next thing we do is we we want to make these top nodes M03 and M04 in each cluster. We want to make them root reflectors. Um, now that is going to be service affecting for those nodes. So the first thing we do is we drain those nodes. Um, so if I do this, and I've done both just to move us along a bit, but you can see kubectl all drain, and I've said ignore, ignore daemon sets. So it, drain, it would drain any production workloads off these clusters, mm -hmm. and then cordon the clusters, uh, sorry, off these nodes, and then cordon the nodes. And you can yep. see that, um, Calico node and kube proxy have been ignored, which is fine because if the if there's no production, if there's no workloads, then it doesn't matter what the state of those yeah. is. Um, yeah. The other thing is we might we can sometimes see that the API servers have moved, although in this case they haven't. Um, let's just see. Yeah, they haven't because if by chance the API servers are running on the correct nodes. Uh, all right, so so that mm -hmm. basically we've made M zero three and M zero four um, drained, and now we're going to add the root reflector um, cluster configuration. Now I'm going to copy paste that in. What that actually does is we switch to use the cluster A config, and then using a calico cuttle command, we patch the node configuration for M A M zero three and we add this BGP root reflector cluster ID, and we do the same for AM04. Now what the cluster ID is, is basically because so much stuff in networking gets complicated because of high availability. If you, in an ideal world, you'd say, oh, well, you just have one root reflector, but you can't because obviously high availability. So these, yeah. these root reflectors need a way of knowing that they are working together as a cluster, root reflector cluster. And that's what mm -hmm. the, the root reflector cluster ID is. So it looks like a multicast IP address. I know what you mean. As long as they both have the same yeah. cluster ID, yeah? Um, gotcha. Yeah, and I'll do the same for cluster B, um, except the cluster ID is different. In theory, I think it could be the same but it just didn't feel like a great idea for it no. to be the same. <laughs> Felt risky. So that's yeah. done, um, but they are not root reflectors yet. Um, actually, scratch that, I'm wrong. They are, I think, that, I think that configuration is enough that they now believe that they are root reflectors, but no one else knows that they are. No one mm -hmm. else in the, in, so what we do is we apply some labels uh, thusly. And what we're doing is we're labeling uh, the nodes that are root reflectors with this Kubernetes yep. root reflector equals true, but but no one's doing anything based on that information yet. So what we do last is we we're going to apply this new root, uh, configuration, and what that basically says is we're going to apply this to every node in the cluster, and we're going to say that we should have a BGP peer with the root reflectors. So, so okay. every node should peer, BGP peer with every node that has a root reflector equals true. Yeah. Uh, and we're gonna apply that to both clusters. Bosh. So that's cool. done. Um, and then there's one last step and that's to turn off the, the full node, full node to node mesh. Yeah. Um, so we do that. And that's just, again, a uh, patch on the BGP configuration. And you can see we patched the BGP configuration on both clusters. So now if we look at the BGP status, oops, if I can type, there we go. The top two nodes only have two BGP neighbors. And you can see they're 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. Mm -hmm. And the bottom two nodes are the root reflectors. So they have the two root reflector clients as neighbors, but they also have each other as neighbors. Yeah. But one thing I'm just noticing that's cool here is that BGP, well, actually it did restart, look, 
Uh, and the same is true for cluster B. So we're really close now to having this topology. We've got our topology now is exactly matching what's in the diagram, except for one thing: we don't have any EBGP yet. So the two clusters aren't talking yet. So we just first thing we do is uncordon the um, root reflector nodes. So they, I don't want to jinx it, but it's going really well so far, Chris. Yeah, it's nuts, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's surprising how quick it is as well, considering. Um, Minikube is, is brilliant. I must admit, I used to think of it as not being able to do complicated setups, you know, like it was just something you could throw away. But but this proves yeah. that you can, you can do fairly complex things with it. Hmm. So the next thing we're going to do is build the BGP for each cluster. I'm going a little bit faster than I'd like, um, but I'm conscious we're going to run out of time to talk about why about if, if I don't. Um, so we're going to apply this to cluster A, and what we're doing is we're applying two manual BGP peers, and we're saying that we're applying for any node in cluster A that is a root reflector, it needs to BGP peer with cluster B's root reflector. And all we specify is that that's the IP address. And you notice that we don't actually have to say that, that this is e eBGP. It just knows that it is because that AS number isn't the same as yep. the local AS number. So we got that and we got the mirror image of that on the other cluster. So we sling that on there. And now, if we have a quick look, you'll see that the non root reflector nodes are still only paired with the local root reflectors. So this is cluster B. So we're seeing that this guy down here is only talking to his friends here. Yep. Um, but we can see that the root reflectors are talking to all of their own local nodes and they've got an EBGP pairing with the opposite, their opposite numbers mm -hmm. in the other cluster. Um, and that's all working. I'm not going to bother checking the other side in the interest of time, but we know that those are up and BGP can only be up if it's up in both directions. So we, we, can, we don't need to prove that so much at the moment. Now there is one thing, there's one reason why we're not finished, um, which is that if we look at the routing table now of, is that going to work? Yeah. So if we look at the routing table of just one of the cluster A nodes, this one, the one isn't, that is not a root reflector, mm -hmm. you'll see that it does not yet know about cluster B's roots. There's no 10 to 10 and then no 10 to 11 here. And when I set yeah. this up, I was banging my head against this for a little while before I understood what was going wrong. Um, if I quickly show you the root reflector on cluster A's side, you'll see that it does know. So we're now looking at this root reflector, and it does know. Yeah. It does know about its neighbour. So I thought, what the heck's going on here? And what it is um, is that. Calico has BGP filtering. Um, every BGP peer, it adds routing, root filters, which only accept the routes that it expects to see. Um, and, the, mm -hmm. and the reason you do that is because BGP is so manual that we've all heard those stories about outages caused by BGP. So you put, fil you put filtering everywhere. So this is a, a best practice thing that Calico is doing behind the scenes without us even knowing about it. Um, and in order for us to make cluster A willing to accept cluster B's roots and vice versa, we have to put in place this um, ma this um, manifest. And what we do is on cluster A, we create two IP pools mm -hmm. with, with the addressing of the other cluster and disabled is true. And that okay. now going is false. And what that actually does, and I'm, I'm, it, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I don't love this use. I don't love this use of an IP pool because this isn't an IP pool. But what we're essentially doing is we're telling cluster A that this is routing that it should expect to see, and that therefore in all of its B BGP filter lists, it should it should accept these routes. But that mm -hmm. but this disabled true prevents it from ever doing anything with those routes, like with ever from from ever actually trying to bring up a workload in the in that in that pool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of marking off those blocks as 
existing but not usable that's exactly it and yeah that's a really nice way to say it actually yeah that's exactly it so i yeah like i said i don't love it because it's a little bit opaque um but it it does the job so if we apply that now on both clusters and then we look at our routing table again for cluster a i don't like the naming of this node by the way that's just a mini cube thing um but you can see that's not a root reflector it's a root reflector client so now it has the roots for the other cluster very nice so what yeah so now we have now what we have is this is exactly what the diagram shows and it's showing there the next top is the other the the, the pods and the nodes in the other cluster yeah and actually yeah, that's yeah. it's nice that you bring that up because you can see that two things that are of interest here one is that it's equal cost multipathing yeah which is nice and the other is that it's not doing next hop self so so cluster a this node down here isn't going to go it's not going to route the traffic up through its local root reflectors it's going to go straight to the root reflectors on the other side yeah and, and cut. So you, you skip a hop skip a hop yeah yeah there's a, a bgp thing called next hop self which will um make that behavior change if you wanted to so we're, okay. we're there we just need to show that it works really before, and then before we get to wireguard um so luckily wireguard's so easy to turn on so it won't take long um if we look at the cluster a pods and services excuse me i said cluster a i meant cluster b so you can see the cluster b echo server has this address 10.2.10.139 and we can see by the 10 to 10 that it's definitely in cluster B. Mm -hmm. um, so what the last step for us now is to SSH onto cluster A node M02, which is this guy, down, right. this uh, yep. guy, one down here. Um, and we want to curl IP. Yeah, I'm actually going to do the service first because it it makes more sense to show the service. So the first thing we're going to do is show that we can hit the service being hosted on uh, Kube Proxy on those uh, on cluster B's nodes. Mm -hmm. And because we SSH to cluster A node M02, we've shown end to end that we just did a an HTTP request. And it went directly from M02 to a service over here, and that worked fine. Yeah. And then we can do the same with the pod IP. It's going to work, Mike. I can feel it in my brain. <laughs> I have no doubts. <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing better than I am. Uh, yeah. There you go. Uh, you can see um, that we, yeah, we went from cluster A to the other side. So, so that's cool. So it's a really interesting example case, and it. Uh, I'll do a blog post about this, but it's it's really interesting because some people have a, a, an edge case use for this, but also it, it's a really good learning environment, and it's all free. It's yeah. all done in your laptop. So that, that'll be a blog post so people can go along. So let's stick WireGuard on. We've got ten minutes, so we won't. I don't think we're going to get very far with this, but. Um, okay. But I'll uh, enable it and you can chat a little bit about what it's actually doing. So as you well know, because this is uh, your neck of the woods and you know this stuff better than I do. Amazingly, all I need yeah. to do is that patch the Phoenix configuration. So when I do this, what's what's actually happening behind the scenes? Um, so when you enable WireGuard enable true, um, it's going to add another interface to each of the nodes called WireGuard.Cali. It's going to set up some IP rules, entries, and um, and an extra routing table on the node. So we, we, if we get time, we might be able to take a look at those. And that will direct traffic coming from one pod going to a pod on another node through the WireGuard interface. So a common misconception is that if you had traffic going from one pod to a pod on the same node, that it would all also get encrypted and go through the WireGuard interface, but it wouldn't. Right, okay, it's only it. if it's if it's only if it's leaving the node, going to a pod on another node. Um, could be a host network pod, could be a, a regular pod. So that's reasonable. Um, that's reasonable for the use case where your you know your your vulnerability is on the wire, isn't it? You're worried about on the wire interception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that the common thinking is that. It, 
you know, if someone has access to the machine to to snoop to that level to see the unencrypted traffic going between two pods on the same node, then you've got bigger problems. Yeah, I don't at that point. And this people have differences of opinion, but I must admit, at that point, I wouldn't be trying to solve that. If, if someone was intercepting things on my node, I wouldn't be trying to solve that cryptographically. Um, yeah, that doesn't feel yeah, right. I mean, there's other things you can do at that point. I think. Yeah, you exactly. Can... Yeah, we may actually have a separate session about this. So um, I've just issued um, get node in cast array. Um, and mm -hmm. yeah, you can tell us about this stuff here. Yeah, so um, so another thing I guess that happens when you enable WireGuard is that each node would have a, a, um, a public and private key generated. Um, the, the private key is stored on the node and doesn't leave the node, but the public key is, is as you can see there, put into the, the node um, resource. So, so that oh, way, yeah, so they're different. Yeah, that makes sense. They're different on these two different. Yeah, cool. Uh -huh. So in that way, different nodes know the public keys of all the other nodes that they will peer with. They know their own private key, but they know the public keys of, of so, all the nodes. So they get, they get it from the Kubernetes API. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Um, I'll stick the WireGuard CLI onto all eight nodes quickly. Yeah, cool. Uh, Another common misconception is that, that those, those private and public keys are actually what's used to encrypt the data, but that's not the case. It's used in an, in an initial handshake and setup of the tunnel, and then other keys are exchanged through yeah. that, which are then used to encrypt the traffic. The reason I was chuckling as you said that to myself is because I know if you asked me that in an exam question, I know I'd get it wrong. Because I, I know you're, I, I kind of knew that, that yeah, that, that they're just used for the key exchange, aren't they? Uh, and then you have a symmetric key that's actually being used on the wire. Yeah, um, that, that comes up a, a little bit talking to customers. And so that's something we, we checked on and, and look, looked into. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good example. And it's probably something you can't say enough times because if, if, if I'm getting that wrong, then I'm sure lots of other people are getting it wrong. Um, and I would, if you'd asked me, I would have said that those keys were being used to encrypt the traffic and I, I should know that. <laughs> well, that's what I thought initially when I yeah. started using it, so. Um, we've just had a comment saying, it'd be interesting to see the integration with it, Metal LB. Um, yeah, that, that uh, agreed. Um, just chatting about how this would work with Metal LB and um, I, the the WireGuard aspect or the BGP aspect? Well, what I'm going to do is, I, I, um, David's not clear on which, but I think I think he means both, really. Um, but I think there's so much meat on this already that what we've done today, minus the WireGuard, is going to be the initial blog post. And then we're going, yeah. to, we're going to build on that cluster so people can play along if, at home if they want to, you know. Because people do like to build things. And it's nice to be able to um, test this stuff in a... Uh, in a low risk way and a low cost yeah. way. Um, cool. So I'm installing WireGuard, uh, the WireGuard CLI on all eight nodes, which takes a little bit of time because they've all got yeah. to do the apt updates. One, one thing I could point out, I guess, if is that the WireGuard kernel module is what does the encryption and, and handles the peering and the tunnels and all that kind of stuff. What you're installing now is a CLI just to manage WireGuard. Yeah, that's a really and good point. The kernel module is included from kernel 5.6 onwards, I think. Yeah. And has been back backported to other kernels as well. I'm glad you brought that up because when I initial as soon as I got this cluster working, I thought, cool, how can you know how can I break it again? And one of the ways that I tried to was putting WireGuard on. I was I was pleasantly surprised that it just worked. Um, the other one was eBPF, which doesn't just work. Um, I haven't dug into the specifics of why, but I'm guessing the the Minikube um, the Minikube ISO doesn't contain the necessary libraries or kernel modules or something. Um, I, need to, I need to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, but that again, that would be another fun blog post for the future, maybe. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have just so, enough time, I reckon. When, as soon as this finishes, I'll, I'll jump onto a node. And what do you want me to show? Well, I think it would be interesting to see the rules and the roots, but probably more interesting is just to do pseudo WG show, which would show um from each node's perspective well if you run it on a particular node you'd see all the other nodes that it's managed to peer with the public keys it's learned from the configuration we saw before right um to use to connect to the other peers and um the set of allowed ips that uh each tunnel can 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 handle i guess it's yeah. it's so what we should see is um 
if you had some workload pods on cluster on a node in cluster B, um, on a particular node, say the first node there, had some workload pods, and then you you were looking at the the WireGuard output on one of the other nodes in cluster B. We should you, see that, shouldn't we? You should see the pod IPs. I'm actually in the IPs list. I'm regretting We're installing. In yeah, I'm going to jump. I'm going to see if I can do it in a different window because I'm regretting starting it off. It's going to take too long. So um, let's see if I can do this without. Uh, so if you pick any of the nodes. I'll choose one of the non root reflectors just for the sake of it. So we'll, we'll go with that guy down, that node down there. Um, yep. So it's probably had, yeah, there we go. It's already had WG installed. There we go. Great. OK, um, so there we can see a few things there. How much time do we have? OK, so you can see the public key of this node at the top there, uh, just under interface wireguard.cali. Yeah. Um, you can see the port that it's listening on. So that's what that's the port that this end of the tunnel will listen on. The traffic is UDP between uh, peers in the WireGuard mesh. So they'll communicate using UDP over port 51820. And I should have mentioned before, I guess, that traffic going through the WireGuard.cali interface due to the routing rules, et cetera, um, those packets will get um, encrypted using the, the key that's exchanged during um, key exchange, I guess, mm -hmm. through the tunnel, mm -hmm. uh, like we were discussing. Then they get encapsulated um, as a as a UDP packet uh, addressed to the other end of the tunnel. Right. So that's... Let's see. And if... So those UDP packets are then exchanged. This, and uh, I guess... Is this firework? Is this firewall mark? Yeah. Is it randomized? Because I'm sure I've seen um, different values for that. That's configurable. It's configurable. Okay, right, cool. Now, now you, you will see different values because when when Calico starts up or when Felix starts up, um, it figures out how many firewall marks it needs for various pieces of functionality that are turned on. Ah. And it will select them in order. So oh, the more features you have turned on, the, the firewall marks. Ah, are, that's are interesting. Different. See, that's the kind of thing that I, that's really useful here because I, I did not know <laughs> that at all. So how can I yeah. see... Um, oh, what's the command I need to see to see the different so routing if, tables? There's a, so if you did IP rule for a start... Rule, that's, of course it is. Yeah, I should know that. Um, so you can see... Clear that so it's a bit more readable. The, yeah. So that second rule there, it's saying um, any traffic from any address that doesn't have that firewall mark, send it to table one. Um, now, the reason that the firewall marks used here is because you don't want to have um, loops. Mm -hmm. So you don't want traffic going into the WireGuard interface and then getting routed back to it again. So if it doesn't have the mark, it'll go through the table. But once once it hits the WireGuard interface, it'll get the mark. Mm -hmm. And you, no, we can if, look the mark, at the table, can't if the we? mark that we see here just doesn't match the mark that we saw on the WireGuard show command earlier, we've got big problems. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I got need to match. Yeah, got it. Uh, <laughs> okay, there's a way to that's the mark that WireGuard's going to mark it with. There's a way to show the um, table, isn't it? Is if it you IP do root, I, get IP, one or something? IPRST1 uh, space T space 1. Yeah. What's that doing? What's that abbreviation? IP root show table IP, 1. IP root show, show table 1. Oh, that's yeah. cool. I, so, didn't, I didn't. I didn't know you could abbreviate IP commands like that. <laughs> there you go. I've I learned think Seth, something good. I think Seth showed me that one. Oh, nice. Um, so you'll see the cider blocks there for the remote pods, I think, mm -hmm. Mm. or for the other the, for the pods on the other nodes. The other nodes. That's right. Yeah, because it's worth saying. Yeah. It's worth saying that the, 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 yeah. the, the wire guard is existing only within each cluster. So one possible, yeah. one impossible extension we could look to do here is to see if we can enable. Obviously, that that wouldn't be a calico thing, but we could we could have some fun. It, see if we technically, it would be possible to yeah. to peer two clusters. Yeah. All right, and Mike. That. We're out of time already. Um, ah, so well, I, what did I tell you when we were prepping? Good. Didn't I say? <laughs> didn't I say we'll run out of time? We always do. Um, let me switch back to our cameras. There we go. Um, so yeah, um, that was really that was really good. I really enjoyed it, and we had quite a few people um, watching the whole way through. So I'm sure people were finding it useful as well. So um, thanks so much for doing that. Um, it, we're no problem. Most likely, the next session will be with Peter, I believe, but it's not confirmed yet. So just just for people listening in, um, I think that's likely to be after Christmas now, but we'll see. Um, but yeah, all that remains is is. Thanks so much, Mike. That was that was enjoyable. I, I, I had fun doing that. And um, no problem. It was a real pleasure. You did a lot of 
all the work. To be honest. No, no, <laughs> so. no, no, it's all good. Um, and if anyone wants to watch it back, then it'll be uh, it'll be on YouTube imminently. And um, Mike, if you just stay on the line for a sec, uh, we'll have a quick uh, debrief. So thanks very much, folks. Take care.